Well, hello and welcome to the Reflectors Ministry Handbook Training. Um, if you're watching this video, there's a high likelihood that you are signing up to serve with this ministry. And for that, we cannot say thank you enough. I cannot say thank you enough. Uh, we say all the time that it's, it's, uh, it's only because of the volunteers that this ministry even exists or can happen. And so uh, thank you for your partner. Thank you for your willingness uh, to just invest and to give up your time and energy and um, you know, we're going to start this training um, with just a little bit of the heart um, before we get into some of the boring logistical um, ins and outs. But, you know, one of the things that you'll realize is that perhaps you're signing up, perhaps you're joining the team, um, because this is an area where you want to give. Uh, and, uh, and for that, we say thank you. We bless you. Um, but one of the things you'll learn is that uh, this ministry is about more than giving. And you'll realize that through relationships that you build and through the folks you get to interact with, you'll receive much. And uh, I'm excited for you. And, uh, and again, I'm so grateful for you. So I do want to start with, um, and by the way, hopefully you have a, a copy of this. If you don't, why don't you hit pause real quick. Go to reflectorsministry.org. Go underneath the resources section and you'll see the handbook PDF. You can click on that. You can download it. It's a lot of pages, so I don't know if I would suggest printing it, uh, but you can at least find it there. But hopefully you have a copy of this. And uh, what we have in the front, um, the front uh, side of the folder, the front pocket, is this thing called the Five Stages of Disability Attitudes. And, uh, and I want to use this just as a framework because this has really been the framework and kind of the thing that has... Uh, built this ministry and has kind of undergirded the philosophies and the theologies that, um, that this ministry is based on. And um, so if you look at the five stages, you'll see it's kind of a continuum of basically your worldview or your attitude towards people with disabilities. Uh, and so for us as a church, we want to always be moving up uh, this continuum. <coughs> so let me briefly go over kind of uh, what First of all, what it is, and then second of all, what it implies for us. So you have some folks that are in stage one, which is called ignorance. And uh, folks in this ignorance stage are, well, ignorant uh, to people with disabilities. Perhaps they've had very limited exposure or um, they're just not comfortable because the lack of exposure, the lack of interaction that they've had with folks with disabilities um, or you could have people in this stage that just really have negative and ill-informed kind of worldviews or ideas of what people with disabilities are or, um, yeah, there's, there could be a lot of negativity. I won't go into it. But most people are just genuinely, they're ignorant just because, uh, not on purpose, just because of life circumstances. And so once they're exposed to people with disabilities and have someone with a disability in their life or in their church family. Um, sometimes folks will move at least to that, that part of like, okay, recognition, but pity, where their attitude is kind of like, oh man, like that really stinks to be them. And um, there could even be some still pretty negative things going there to say like, well, I'm glad that's not me, or I'm glad that's not my kid. Um, so certainly as a church, we want to move everyone in our entire congregation, whether they're hands-on with this ministry or not, past stages one and two, at least to stage three. And I'm guessing that you find yourself probably at least at stage three to say, man, I see people with disabilities and I see that the way they're isolated, I see the way they're treated, I see some of the needs they have, and I want to do something. I want to care. That's stage three. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. And all of us need care. All of us need something in our life. All of us have a dependency and a need uh, that needs to be met by someone. Um, but again, I told you before, what I love about this document and what I love about what God is doing in this ministry is that it's more than just a one-way street of care where I have all the assets and you have all the needs. It's more than that that God calls us to and that God gives to us as a gift when we enter into relationship. And so that's stage four is more than just saying, how can I help you? Um, it's entering into just genuine relationship where it's like, how are you? Tell me about yourself. Um, where I actually might even be able to better know your needs just because I know you as a person better. And what radically happens then too is then they know your needs as well. Um, so we want to facilitate, our, our, really, our role in this ministry is to facilitate discipleship, 
um, but also belonging. And that, and that thing, uh, the core piece of belonging to something or belonging somewhere is that you're known. And not only that you're known, but that you also know others. Uh, and so to facilitate relationships is one of the best things we can do as a ministry. And so will you come in and will you have a role of serving and helping? Of course you will. Um, but more important than that, I hope that you find that you have the ability, the, the context, the environment where you can foster a genuine relationship. Uh, because at the end of the day, to have someone who knows you and who loves you uh, for who you are, it, it, it's way more dignifying and it's way more meaningful than just someone who shows up uh, to just be your helper. Think about it from the lens of your life. And then stage five is called co-laborers. Um, and essentially, God has, has called us, Christ has called us to more than just making friends, but making disciples. And so what's beautiful is not only to see folks who come into the Reflectors ministry, participants who have special needs, to, to learn about and receive the love of Christ, but then to realize that they have gifts, they have abilities, they have things to offer the church. Uh, and to offer the kingdom of God in this world, and that God has a purpose for their life. And um, so to encourage them in that and to have, again, you think about belonging. Belonging is knowing others and being known, but it's also having a place in a family or in a community. And so our, our goal, for example, is, is that we would love every Reflectors participant and every person with a developmental disability at Faith Church. Frankly, anyone, no matter their age or difference, that if they belong to Christ, that, uh, then that what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 is true for them, that they have a part of the body. And, and, and Paul even says it's the parts that we think are weaker that are even more indispensable. Um, so that's the five stages. We want to be pushing down that. And, and here's the thing about the five stages. Number one, you could, you could use this for any, any people group, and especially marginalized people group. And, uh, and I know for me that, and, I, and I'll confess to you, I'm not always at stage five. Uh, and sometimes it's just like, man, I'd rather just help this person and move on. So we, we all need encouragement that way. But I might do pretty well when I think about my friends with disabilities. But how am I doing when I think about those who are elderly? Or how am I doing when I think about little kids? Do I believe that they need more than just care? Um, do I even have that compassion in my heart to care for them? Um, but also the, the willingness to enter into relationship with them, even, even though I might not understand and that I have a lot to learn. But then to believe, too, that they are so valuable to the kingdom of God. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is, really, if you look at the five stages, the most radical piece of it is it is what God has done for us. He's more than just cared for us. He has entered into relationship with us intimately because of his son and by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. And then he would have the audacity, the God who can do anything, the God who is perfect, the God who made everything and is sovereign over everything, he calls us and he chooses us and he equips us to be his co-laborers. And so we follow his model. So that's the five stages and I would encourage you um, ponder for a second where you are and what would it take, and maybe it is just stepping into this ministry that's going to take you to the next stage. So beyond that, I want to also look at um, the pages three and four of your handbook, and, and essentially these are just our core values, so let me go over these quickly. The faith church mission statement is to reach the disconnected and grow the connected. Reflectors ministry started uh, because of the data showing how many people are disconnected from the local church because of a developmental disability, because of the way churches have neglected or just have failed uh, to greet them, to meet them, to welcome them, to value them. Um, but it's not just reaching them and having them become part of this church, but helping them grow in their knowledge and in their walk with Jesus. So our our, our this ministry of Reflectors very much fits into the mission statement of Faith Church, and it's our mission as well. Particularly our vision for Reflectors ministry, as I mentioned it earlier, but it's the facilitation of two things. We want to help people with developmental disabilities at Faith Church to grow in their walk with Jesus, to know Jesus, and to grow in their walk with Him. That's discipleship. And number two, to facilitate belonging 
which means that they are growing in relationships, uh, that they are known and being known, uh, and that they have opportunity to be a meaningful part of this community at Faith Church. So we really, every, everything we do, we want to revolve around these two things. How does it help uh, every participant grow in Jesus? And number two, to foster relationships that are going to be meaningful uh, and lead to that place of belonging. Our three beliefs, uh, I'll quickly go over. Everyone has value because they bear the image of God and they are fearfully and wonderfully made. So we value them no matter what, period. Every human being we value. Number two, every human being is sinful and equally in need of Jesus. And I'm not going to get into the deep theology of, of well, what's, what's that understanding level where, you know, and we think about this often with little kids, um, where Jesus will rescue them even if they haven't confessed Jesus. My point is, all of us sin. And the Bible says that all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so we're going to do everything we can to make sure that our doors aren't closed to anyone, even if we don't think that they can grasp that intellectually. Because knowing Jesus comes out in more places and in different ways than just intellect or just the words that we can verbally say. And so we believe that everyone needs to hear the gospel. And we trust the Holy Spirit in that process uh, to have that sink in however he would. But our mission is that, look, we all sin, no matter our age, no matter our ability level, and we all need Jesus. And we trust Jesus to that work, but we're going to proclaim the gospel uh, to everyone. And I guess what I would say, too, is that the grace of Jesus is sufficient for everyone. And the third one is, every member of God's kingdom possesses indispensable gifts. I mentioned it before. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 12, talks about the parts of the body and if our folks belong to Jesus, if, if someone with a disability belongs to Jesus, they are not disabled from doing God's work. In fact, it's the Holy Spirit that enables them, just like he enables anyone else, to do God's work. And so these are foundational beliefs from the Word of God that just make us say, okay, yeah, if these things are true, um, then this is what we're going to be about as a ministry. Um, so the three values, I would say... Uh, if you forget anything else in this video or in this training, try to remember these three things. And this is getting more to the nitty-gritty because there's going to be a few things that come up here. They're going to be pretty specific. that are going to take a lot of time to learn, to practice, especially if you've not really been in the field of special ed, which is most of us. Um, there's just things that are going to, you're, you're going to learn along the way. But if I could give you three nuggets of kind of overarching principles or values, here, here's what they would be. We want, in, in every uh, setting of our ministry, we want people to know that they're loved. That they're loved by God and they're loved by us. Second, we want to do whatever we can to help them grow in their love for Jesus and their love for others. Those are the two greatest commandments, and so that's what discipleship is. It's growing in our love for God and love for others. And then third, we want always to be a safe environment. And even these things, I know they're a little subjective, a little gray, but here's the thing. If you can walk away from whatever context you're serving in and say, man, did, did the participants or the participant that I was working with, did they know that they were loved? I think so, yes. Uh, did I do everything I could to help them grow and to encourage them um, in, their, in their walk with Jesus or just um, as, as a person? Did I... Did I help them grow even in their relationship with me or with somebody else? If you can say yes to that, um, that's a great thing. And then lastly, was it a safe environment? If you can say yes to those three questions, it was an awesome experience. Uh, because we always walk away, we always question like, am I doing the right thing? Was this even a win? So for example, on a Sunday morning, if you leave Sunday morning and no one's been able to say, hey, great job doing X, Y, or Z, or like, this was a great morning, or this was a terrible morning. You might just walk away saying, like, was this even good? And I want you to know that if you can say yes to these three things, or even if you're in the heat of the moment and you're not sure what to do, come back to these three things. Um, because if you're doing these three things, um, you're doing what's right and what's best. Um, the last piece of this core value section uh, is just these six, six objectives, the six eyes, and basically what does it mean to be part of a serving team? And this goes for any serving team 
at Faith Church. Um, and I'm not going to go over these, uh, every detail or every word, but a quick summary. Number one, it's about relationships. It's more than just um, tasks. It's about getting to know people. I've talked about that a lot already. Um, interceding is number two. It's just saying we value prayer greatly, and we pray for each other a lot. We like to share prayer requests, volunteer to volunteer. We like to pray for our families. Um, so prayer is, is really important. It's probably the most effective thing we can do. Um, the third one is invitation. And this ministry has really grown primarily through invitation and through personal contact. And a lot of families come because another family came and because they've invited them. Uh, and same with our volunteer team. Uh, a lot of people step up because they've been tapped on the shoulder by somebody else who's already serving and say, hey, I think you'd be really great in this ministry. Uh, number, number four is, is really obvious that we would set the tone for inclusion and that inclusion uh, is a value, but how do we live it out? Uh, you know, one of the things I, I, I like to tell people is like, look, when you're wearing that reflector shirt even, uh, whether you like it or not, people are looking at you and, uh, and how you're interacting. And again, a lot of it comes to those people that just are, are naive and maybe like, well, how do I interact with a person with Down syndrome? And, and obviously, we'd love to just tell them, you, act, you interact with them like a human being. Um, but, but to model it, I think, for people is something profound that you do, whether you know people are watching or not. Um, the fifth thing is looking at the interests of others. Another obvious one, another thing that has to do with relationships. But what I would say here is that um, you know we have a profound opportunity even um, to bless siblings and parents and 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 other family members and friends uh, of our participants. And uh, there's there would be something profound about, and this would be a challenge to you, to even know the names of one of, of our participant siblings. To not only say, hey. You know, how are you doing, um, but uh, uh, to the participant, um, but also to, to call the sibling by name and say, how are you doing? Um, and even the parents, uh, that means a lot to them, and they're often overlooked. Um, and the last thing is instruct and disciple. And again, it comes back to our mission statement and our vision statement that discipleship is, it's where it's at. We want our people to know Jesus and to grow in Jesus um, which means, and I'll, you know, I'll just say it, uh, this is so much more than a babysitting or a child care ministry. Uh, this is a discipleship ministry. Um, so just a reminder that that's what we're all about. All right, I'm going to pause here for a second, and then the next video will be the nitty-gritty, and that's it. So now we're going to get to the fun stuff, the nitty-gritty, the, the nuts and bolts, um, if all the stuff we covered was roots and stump, this is all limbs and branches. Um, so starting on page five, we've got our volunteer job descriptions. And this basically just lays out kind of the, um, yeah, all the expectations, um, what's, what's kind of involved with the different roles that we have. Obviously, our Sunday mornings are probably our biggest piece. We also have our midweek stuff at the Dyer campus, um, Faith Kids support. Um, special events. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave some of those details for your meeting with um, your campus director. Um, but here's what I'll say about special events, which is the last thing referenced here. Um, we have events throughout the year, and and some of them are um, for an age group of people with special needs. Sometimes it's just a huge, massive, fun event for the whole family. Um, sometimes it's really a, a parent-centered event. So we got a lot of different things. Um, all of these are what we would call um, all hands on deck type events where um, you're not expected, just because you're part of the team does not mean you're expected to be at every one of these events. Uh, but any of them you can make would be a huge gift and a huge blessing. Um, and uh, you can find out those events. Um, we do all of our weekly scheduling. So whatever you're, if, if you're signing up for our Sundays or Wednesdays or whatever, um, all of that scheduling will come through my faith, but our special events, it's always going to be some sort of sign up or RSVP system to serve. So look for those always on our webpage, reflectorsministry.org, or in our newsletter. And if you're not sure, if you're not getting the newsletter yet, uh, you can also find a link for that online on our webpage um, to subscribe for that. You'll probably also be added automatically in your application process. But 
Um, just so you know what those are, whether it's Night to Shine um, or some family fun night or, or respite, whatever it is, um, we'd love to have you if you're able to um, just let us know, sign up for those events as they come along. So let me hop right to policies on page seven. Um, food policy, um, outside of our Wednesdays, which um, uh, may or may not have a meal component to it, we try to just say no food, um, especially on Sundays. It's not an RSVP system, and so um, people see severe allergies or dietary restrictions as special needs or as disabilities. Uh, and any one of those folks could walk through our door uh, at any time. And, so the, and, and besides the potential dangers of, of allergies or, or whatever, um, it's also just kind of etiquette um, that, uh, you know, maybe not everyone had breakfast necessarily this morning, and so to be eating in front of someone, um, it's, just, it's just best to not, to not bring food or drink um, water. You know, it's fine. Coffee, I know you're probably finishing it from between services. Um, the last thing I'll say is just be, be aware that there are participants that if you are eating or drinking something, they'll probably find a way to get it from you. Um, all right, so moving on, this is the big one, and this is why you need to watch this video. Uh, and there'll be a question specifically for this, because this is, this is one of the biggest deals. This two-to-one ratio policy, our kids' ministry has it at Faith Church, our student ministry has it at Faith Church. We extend this policy to any participant, any person of any age who has a developmental disability, especially who's checked in to Reflectors as part of the programming, there always has to be at least two adult volunteers present. Um, now this, this could mean in, in the worship center, this could mean uh, in a hallway, in a classroom, in the restroom, if the person needs assistance in the restroom, they're always, even if it's just one participant, it could be multiple participants, there always has to be at least two adult volunteers present. Uh, and I don't like doing this over video because I want to make sure that there's understanding. Uh, I'll quickly tell a short story. There's just, there, there's a church that recently um, finally settled this lawsuit uh, after, you know, years, a few years ago now, a 19-year-old male volunteer took a um, child with autism in the special needs ministry for a walk break, a sensory break. Um, and after the service, the child made an accusation to his mom about something this volunteer had done. Now, right there, whether he did it or not, the damage is done. Um, it's done to the family. It's done to the church. It's done to the volunteer. Um, and so what the two-to-one uh, ratio policy does is it protects all of those things. It protects the family, the participant. It protects the volunteers, and it protects the church. Um, and I think in the whole history of faith, church has only ever been one uh, ever accusation uh, in the kids' ministry, and there were multiple adult volunteers present that said, no, that, that's a false accusation, and it was diffused like that. Uh, and so for us, it's just a huge value. And I know sometimes it takes creativity um, because if you've got, you know, you got a participant in the room, you've got a participant in the worship center, you've got a participant taking a walk, and you've got a participant now who needs to use the restroom. And kind of all the adult volunteers are scattered. And so if it's like, you know, if there's three participants in the restroom, or I'm sorry, three participants in the classroom, one of them says, I have to use the restroom, but there's only two volunteers, two or two adult volunteers in the classroom. Well... Either you're going to wait or we're all going to go to the restroom. I, I hope that makes sense. Um, again, doing this vid via video is kind of strange because I can't check for understanding. But I'm hoping you understand. Um, and, and I'm sorry to drill that home so much, but it's probably the biggest, most important policy we have. All right, so medical response. Um, this is something we have to talk about, though I can tell you by, at, at this point in 2018, we, we have yet to have any significant injuries or medical emergencies, but I have to talk about it just in case, um, just so we know what to do if, the, if uh, something arises or a situation presents itself. So your role as a volunteer, uh, I want you to know right away um, that expectations for you are, are, are minimal um, when it comes to responding to something that takes medical expertise. Um, even if you're a nurse, this, this, a lot of this stuff is, is voluntary. But 
Um, here's kind of the procedure, the protocol. If you're working with somebody and there's a, there's a medical emergency, um, we're going to ask for help right away. Um, and even if you're not sure, even if it's a cut and it's like, ooh, that doesn't look great and you gotta get a Band-Aid or whatever, um, I want you to know, first of all, always call for help. Um, there's, there's, there should always be a staff member that has a walkie-talkie, and every campus has a medical team there, ready, available. And so what we're gonna do, if it's any sort of medical emergency, is um, we're gonna radio the medical team, and they're, they're gonna, I promise they'll get there quickly. And so the downtime that you have from the moment something happens to when they come is gonna be very short. So my biggest coaching is in that time frame, do not try to fix anything um, from the lens of, say, somebody dislocated uh, a finger. Don't try to pop it back in. Uh, or say somebody fall, uh, fell and hit their head and they, they're not quite conscious. Don't pick them up, all right? Just make sure the area is clear and that the person is safe and that the scene is safe. That's the most important thing you can do. Um, but always call for help. And even if it's just like, oh, I can't deal with this, call for help and have somebody come in and at least to be nearby until medical team arrives um, that is comfortable and that can just be a presence to make sure that the scene is safe. Um, all right, bathroom and personal care. Again, um, it's not an expectation of you. It's voluntary if you're willing um, that if someone needs help in the restroom or if someone needs help changing a diaper, whatever it is, um, that if, if you're willing to do that, that's something that we do uh, offer and want to offer to, to families. Um, so when you're working with someone, they have to use the restroom. You'll get to know participants quickly and, and uh, you can always ask, hey, like somebody, you know, so-and-so needs to use the restroom, do they need help? Um, but the best place to find that information is in the participants IWP, and I'm gonna go over that in a second. Uh, it's basically their paperwork. The Individualized Worship Plan is what IWP stands for. Um, and there's a section <clears throat> uh, for bathroom usage uh, where basically the parent lets us know that the person can use the restroom independently or they need help and volunteers or staff may help um, or they need help and the parent prefers to be called or paged. Um, so that information is in the IWP, um, so you can check that. If the person uh, is independent, um, it's still standing outside the door, two volunteers doing the escort, um, maybe giving verbal prompts like, hey, don't forget to wash your hands or whatever. Um, if the person does need assistance, again, two volunteers, that's, that's the big one. Uh, and just give dignity uh, in the process. Don't, you know, uh, for example, uh, there's a participant that always needs some help just, you know, pulling his pants back up. And so instead of just doing that and getting uh, in his business to do that, um, just even asking like, hey, can I help you? Um, so just give, give dignity um, and appropriateness in all of that. Sickness, uh, essentially if you're sick, don't come. It's that simple. Uh, and it's not because we don't love you or want you, but because we don't want the germs. And, and, and honestly, for, for um, there's some of our participants, for them to get sick, and even if it's just a cold or a flu, is, it's a big deal. Uh, and so just text the morning of, let us know if you can, let the staff person know, whoever um, is in charge of the team that, that you're part of. Um, let them know uh, if you can, and, uh, and no worries. Stay home, rest up, be well. Uh, and then page eight, last part of the policies here um, is, is safe touch. And again, this is a policy that our kids ministry and student ministry has as well. But it's basically just be cognizant and aware of how you're using your hands. And, um, you know, here's what I'll say about hugs. <laughs> um, I used to be a big hugger. I'm not as much of a hugger anymore. But I know a lot of people, like, it's just natural for them to give a hug for greeting. I am not saying that you're not allowed to hug. Um, what I would say about hugging is be aware of what's appropriate. Um, you know, we have a, a team participant who every time I see him, he's going to give me a hug. And that's cool and that's fine and we'll give a short hug. Um, where, I, where I have to really encourage this though a little bit more is say when we have uh, a young man uh, who's a participant who wants to continually hug a young woman who's a volunteer 
Um, that's where we need to help just kind of draw some boundaries and appropriateness. Um, my rule of thumb, handshakes, high fives, fist bumps, those are always good. Um, and so uh, roll with those. That would be my encouragement to you. And kisses are probably never appropriate. Um, lap sitting, uh, he, here's my bottom line principle, and this goes for the hugs and, and that stuff too. Treat a person their age. Uh, one of the things we're tempted to do, especially, I, I feel like people with Down syndrome especially, for some reason we're tempted to, to treat them like they're, like they're infants, you know, or like they're toddlers and like, oh, aren't they just so cute and, and kisses and all these hugs are, are cool. And, uh, and it's not, it's not cool, um, especially if they're, you know, 20, 30 years old. Um, you would never treat another 20 or 30 year old that way. Uh, and so, so I use that, I use that principle for lap sitting. Um, if it's cool for a typical four-year-old to sit on your lap, it's probably cool for a reflector's four-year-old to sit on your lap. If it's not cool for a typical 14-year-old to sit on your lap, it's not cool for one of, uh, the reflector's 14-year-old to sit on your lap. Um, and back rubs, I would say off, uh, just, just don't, <laughs> don't do them. Uh, and again, just the casual touch. Again, I am I am a little bit of a toucher, and so if it's you know putting my hand on somebody's shoulder, or whatever, just be aware of personal space, and be aware of what is fostering a safe environment in an appropriate environment. Again, it's it's not that I don't trust you, even though I might not know you. <laughs> um, uh, it's just again, it's creating a culture where um, we are full of integrity, uh, and that everyone feels. Uh, safe in that way. Uh, so page nine is just a brief kind of uh, visual uh, training on first aid for seizures, um, which would fall underneath that medical um, medical emergency section. Now on to some of the fun stuff. We're going to talk about behavioral strategies. Um, Woohoo! I, I could talk about this for a long time. Uh, and we have an awesome behavior, behavioral strategist on our team. Her name is Nicole, and she could talk a bit about it for longer than I could. Um, but I just want to give you some, some overall principles. You know, you'll, you'll have opportunity and you'll learn a lot as you go, and you'll also learn how individualized this stuff is. But uh, I just want to give you some of the general principles just to kind of equip you a little bit for dealing with who knows uh, what you'll deal with. So... Um, you'll see on page 10 and 11, page 10 is kind of uh, all about, uh, yeah, the positive side and how to be proactive in just encouraging positive behavior. Uh, and then the right side is just how do we respond when things aren't so positive. Um, so uh, let me start with this. Positive reinforcement is a concept or a principle uh, that works. And, and uh, essentially, it works better than punishment. So reinforcement is saying, I want more of that behavior. And so typically, it's going to be right, the non-task positive behavior. And so positive meaning, I'm going to give you something. I'm, I'm adding uh, some sort of reward motivation. It's kind of like when you get a bonus at work. That's positive reinforcement. You're getting something um, to reinforce the good behavior, the good work that you've done, and in hopes that that'll continue. Uh, but it makes you want to be there. It makes you trust more, it, all this stuff. Um, of course, we know that we're prone, um, often when dealing with negative behaviors, not to reinforcement, but to um, punishment. And so punishment is more responding to negative behaviors and saying, stop that. Um, and I could go into all the, you know, the science of what works and what doesn't, but um, positive reinforcement works, and, and it really, it drives kind of what, um, yeah, what we want to do, and in, in that, um, yeah, there will always be uh, negative behaviors to respond to, but we want to, as much as we can, proactively encourage on-task, positive, appropriate behavior. Um, so... I'll put it this way. I'm not, I'm not going to go too much into, into you know, the word for word here. Um, but I'll put it this way. All behavior is communication. And so even negative behavior, um, what, what is the person communicating? Uh, and, and I'd like to kind of break it down in three categories. Uh, number one, it could be that they're communicating negative behavior. 
um, a desire for attention. And so you all know that person that acts out because they're not getting attention. Um, we had a kiddo that, um, that knew that all they had to do was hit somebody to get my attention. Uh, and I had students like that uh, when I was a teacher and uh, they've learned it's been reinforced because they get attention even though it's negative attention. It's been reinforced to them that if they do this really terrible thing, they'll get attention. Um, so let me pause there for a moment. Let me say that. What, what can we do, not just for attention seekers, but um, that, that's also just going to help anyone? Um, and here's what I want to say. With positive reinforcement, praise, 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 good behavior and on-task behavior. For someone who's an attention seeker, first of all, it's what they want. You know, it's, it's possible that they go through a lot of days and are never told good job ever. Um, and so for us to give the attention that they want, but we're giving it to good things, um, not only will that help them, that helps everyone. Um, and number two, as much as possible, ignore negative behavior. And I know this can be difficult, but um, this is where I would tell you um, to use the redirection principle um, or strategy where uh, you can point out, you say, no, that's not okay, um, but give redirection, meaning let's try this instead. Um, so, you know, when my son is uh, really frustrated at home and it's just like, ah, no, I, you know, and, and it's just so annoying, all I want to say is stop doing that. Um, but really, what's most effective is when I actually have a redirection principle and I can calmly say, no, that's not, that's not okay, that's not appropriate. Let's try, and oftentimes in that instance, let's try using words to express your feelings instead of really annoying sounds, uh, whines, whatever. Um, so, uh, so this is a general principle, not just for people who are attention seekers, but especially for people who are attention seekers. But just in general, positive reinforcement looks this way. We're always noticing the good stuff and we're giving attention and praise uh, to it. Um, and any sort of you know, way to motivate and, and continue that um, as opposed to just saying no, no, no all the time. Um, keeping a positive and giving attention to that. Um, another, so besides attention seeking, Another possible thing being communicated with negative behavior or off-task behavior, inappropriate behavior, is a communication for control. Um, so I'll use my son again, and this kid, the kids are great for this. Um, when he was learning to put on his shoes by himself, <laughs> uh, I, we, I would say, we're going to go somewhere, we're going to get in the car, you need to get your shoes on. And he would say, no. Now, why would he say no? It's because I'm imposing my control over his life or scenario at that moment, and he didn't want that. It's like, no, I'm playing cars by myself right now. Like, no, I don't want to put my shoes on. I don't want to do what you're going to tell me to do. Um, and so one, uh, one principle that works, one strategy that works, uh, is simply giving choices. Um, it's not rocket science, but it makes a big difference. And so even for him, I would say, well... Do you want to put on your shoes by yourself, or do you want me to help you put on your shoes? Um, and it didn't work 100% of the time, but 90% of the time, he would say, Dad, put my shoes on, or I can put my shoes on. Um, again, it's, it's not so much that he, he was so against the task or even against leaving. It was just because, like, I imposed my control, and so his, his immediate reaction was, or response um, was, no, I'm not going to do that resistance. Um, off-task behavior, disobedience, whatever you want to call it. Um, so by giving him um, uh, the choices, he felt empowered. And again, it's not just for people who are control seekers. This helps everyone. So give choices. Uh, call out. Give attention to positive behavior. Um, some other simple strategies that work for any anyone, um, but especially as we think positive reinforcement and, and motivators, um, this is not bribing. Um, but we'll often take um, a preferred activity or something that the individual really loves uh, and, and we'll use that as, as motivation. Um, and again, it's not bribing because I say, you go to work, you know, maybe 40 hours a week if you're employed, um, 
and are you going to go if you're not getting paid? <laughs> uh, now I know that's not, that's not why we go to church, right? We're not getting paid. Um, but at the end of the day, someone who's a, who's a very black and white concrete thinker, um, they, they just need that tangible, like, okay, yeah, well, the, I can do that. Um, just a bit of motivation. So one thing that can really help with that is just a simple first-then statement or even a first-then visual card. Um, and this was a huge breakthrough for one of our participants who loves keys. And it was awesome because it was totally the way the Lord works. We had been praying as a team, Lord, give us the keys uh, to just know how to get through to some, some, some of these different participants. And for this participant, it was literally keys. So for him, we learned that if we gave him some time with keys, that motivator, all of a sudden he did everything. I mean, participating in, in the memory verse and uh, in, in the way that he does um, and, and, and completing uh, the activities and, and sitting uh, for the lesson, all this stuff. Um, and it just a simple first then of first lesson, then keys. And then once, once his time, and it's a controlled time with the keys, once that's done, then it's first prayer time, then keys. And so, excuse me, that rhythm um, of the first then statement, it's so simple. Um, but the more you follow through on it, too, the more trust you build. Like, okay, then I know, I know that he knows that um, we mean it when we say, yeah, we, you can totally do that today, but first you need to do this as well. So it's kind of working together in that. Um, so those are just a couple strategies. There's more, and again, you'll see how individualized they are um, the more you work with uh, different folks. But um, here's the thing when responding to negative behavior, just two things I wanna say. First of all, um, again, the more calm you can be, um, uh, the better, and um, don't, don't get into power struggles. If somebody says no, it's like, oh, yes, you will. And then they'll say, oh, no, I won't. And, and things just escalate. Do not be a person that feeds uh, the escalation. We want to de-escalate as much as we can. And so with that, I will say our policy, um, especially for people uh, who aren't trained in, in, in the program we use called Safety Care, but even people who are part of Safety Care, our policy is always hands off. Anytime you put hands on, even if someone's running away or even if someone's about to go hit somebody. Anytime you put hands on, you're at risk to yourself and to the participant. Now, I know that, obviously, what's the greater risk? If, if something does happen where somebody's bolting out the door and they're heading for, you know, 81st Street or whatever, 81st Ave, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to hold them back because being hit by a car would be a lot worse than me grabbing their hand. But the principle is this. We want to use any de-escalation we can before it would even get to that point. Um, of having to be hands-on. So, um, we, Nicole, who I referenced, uh, she uh, leads a training program. It's a, it's a nationwide training program called Safety Care, which, uh, first of all, the whole thing is a de-escalation strategy um, curriculum program, um, but they do have hands-on components if something escalates to that point where the person's at danger to self or others. Uh, it... it, it has in-depth training on ways to uh, kind of deal with that in a hands-on way that's as safe as possible and it's very researched. Um, if you're not trained in that, I, you should really never be uh, hands-on to deal with behaviors, physically hands-on. Um, but if you want to be trained as a safety care, um, uh, yeah, in safety care, um, certified in safety care, let us know, let Nicole know. We do trainings about twice a year, so we'd love to have you be part of that. All right, that's all I'm going to say about that. Pages 12, 13, and 14, this is something that I got when I was a teacher at Elam, and I endorse all 104 things. I'm not going to read any of these, but these are 104 ways to create a positive environment. They're all fantastic. Read them um, and uh, see how much you can uh, apply them. Uh, 15 and 16, I just want to talk about spiritual formation um, and how do we get abstract concepts like God and faith and, and these things that um, are really just kind of, they're not super tangible. How do we explain them to folks who think 
very concretely, um, very, in a very black and white way. And so kids, young kids and their development think much more concretely. What you say and what you see is what you get. Um, whereas when you develop and when you grow up, often you, you start developing more um, of the gray stuff and, and kind of, um, yeah, different, different, um, different types of learning styles and you can kind of make metaphors work. And, um, but people with developmental disabilities often are still, they still have that more black and white, more concrete learning style, and especially people with autism, very, very black and white. Um, thinking style and learning style, um, which can be a real asset and gift. Um, and so how do, we, how do we make spiritual truths that can sometimes not be so tangible be more tangible? And so you'll see there's kind of an explanation of, again, uh, what is concrete thinking? What are often preferred learning styles of people who think more concretely? Um, visual and kinesthetic. So seeing it, um, and also experiencing it, touching it. And so um, page 16 just offers a lot of different uh, tips and tricks. And, and these are a lot of things that we include in our curriculum and include in our programming intentionally so that it does make sense and that, so that it does stick and so it's easy to understand. Um, so you'll see more visuals, the hands-on, using music, using repetition, um, structure and consistency helps. Um, and then short chunks of information at a time. So here's what, I would, here's what I would say. When using language, think simply. Don't necessarily dumb it down. Um, but just think and speak in a simple way. Uh, and the example I would use is some people might say that what is the gospel? It's that Jesus is the Lamb of God um, who was uh, you know, slain for sinners. He, his blood was spilt and... You know, but he rose again. Like all of these things that, for those of us who, who maybe have, you know, grown up with that language, that makes sense. It's beautiful. For someone who's a concrete learner, none of that makes sense. And so um, I, I like to simply put it this way. The gospel is this. We make bad choices. Those bad choices are called sin. Okay, we all know what bad choices are. There are consequences for bad choices. Well, everyone's lived that in some way. Um, but here's, here's the crazy thing. All of our worst consequences and that, the ones that we deserve probably the most, Jesus took those consequences for us. And that's what it means that he loves us and even forgives us. Um, and then this is a hard concept, but we get to live with him forever. Um, so to explain things in that way, again, I'm, it's not like I'm, you know, Jesus, I, I'm not going to dumb it down or I'm not going to talk to, say, even an adult like they're a kid I just want to explain it in a simple, tangible, relatable way. Um, so use simple language. Um, and uh, yeah, not, not that you can't use metaphors and, and illustrations. Um, but just, you know, avoid the Christianese language. Um, I, I uh, heard this story from a church um, where a, a teenager wanted to uh, be baptized at his church. So he had to meet with the elders and the elder's first question was, son, are you washed in the blood of Jesus? And this, uh, this teenager is just like, gross, right? So he's picturing, he's taking it literally, he's picturing probably a bath or a shower <laughs> in, in blood. Um, so anyway, simple language and um, yeah, don't dumb it down. But um, visuals, if you're a drawer, use it, um, you know, and, and don't be afraid of repetition. All right, so 17 and 18 um, and, and 19, these are um, more etiquette uh, tips and tricks. And, and I'm not going to go through all of them. I will say on page 17, you'll notice talking about people with disabilities uh, or people who have disabilities, it's always about pe person first language. Um, so we don't want to talk about, yeah, I work with autistic kids or, um, yeah, you know that Downs guy uh, who we saw the other day? Um, there's just a few issues with that. Number one, it, it's putting the label first. Uh, and number two, it's not, it, it's, it's describing them by this one component of them. Um, it's kind of like for me, like if I, yeah, the glasses guy, you know, uh, or, uh, or, you know, the music guy, um, or, uh, even worse, like 
the tall guy or the brown haired guy. Like there's so many things like just, you know, my name <laughs> or do you know that I'm a person? Uh, so using person first language, it's kind of a, you, can, you can kind of get the visual there. But then there's a lot of diff- just different tips uh, for communicating with people who have different types of, of disabilities or needs. Um, but the last thing I'll say is on the bottom of 19, these are just the principles when it comes to etiquette and dignity. Always treat the person with respect, no matter how old they are, no matter what their communication style is like. Treat them with respect and courtesy and dignity. Be a good listener. Uh, and in fact, even more than just posturing yourself to listen, posture yourself to learn. Um, relax, obviously, just be yourself. And the last one, this is especially appropriate for, uh, for us as we volunteer, as we serve. Um, you can offer assistance. And again, don't just jump in, offer assistance. Um, but then don't be offended if they say no. Uh, so instead of just you know, seeing somebody's cutting something out, they're having a hard time, don't just go in there, grab the scissors and cut it for them. Say, hey, can I help you with that? Uh, and if they say no, that's okay. Uh, it's their project anyway. Um, and so, um, yeah, you can offer it, but don't insist or be offended when they say no. All right, we are just about to the end. You've done so well. Um, these next few pages are what we give to parents um, when they come, uh, especially for the first time. And you'll see 21, 22, and 23 uh, these are the elements of this IWP that I referenced earlier. Um, the information that we get uh, from the parents about the participant. And this is really the most helpful thing that we can have. Um, so you'll see on there, um, there's strengths and abilities, which we want to know. Like, what do they thrive at? What are they good at? Challenges, uh, communication. We don't want to assume that they can talk or can't talk or have a device, don't have a device. Um, preferred activities, this is really good for the motivation for the first sense statements. Oh, I didn't know that they loved Minions or SpongeBob or Keys or whatever it is. Uh, it's really helpful to know. Motor abilities, again, we don't want to be forcing anyone into um, you know, walking when they really don't prefer to walk or pushing someone's wheelchair uh, when, when they're really independent with it, whatever it is. And then you have that restroom section that I mentioned earlier, obviously allergies, dietary restrictions. Reinforcement and redirection, uh, what works well um, when maybe they're off task or are having inappropriate behaviors. Um, and, uh, and then goals, uh, hopes, dreams for the upcoming year. These are all really helpful. And, uh, and this is my bit of homework to you. The first time you serve, my homework, my assignment to you is to ask for this paperwork for whoever you're going to serve with. Um, so when you find out that you're going to work with so-and-so today, um, the first thing you should be asking is, hey, can I see their IWP? And if you can't remember IWP, just say paperwork, whatever. Um, so that's one of the most helpful things we have. Okay, Th- this is it. The last two sections, there's a lot of pages here, but not a lot that I have to say. If you go from page 24 all the way to page 45, this is the Faith Church Child Safety Policy. Um, Now, fortunately for us, we already covered most of the policies that are pertinent to our programming that happens here at the church. Um, We covered pretty much all of that in our policy section earlier. Um, But the one thing I have to mention and that you'll see here, there's a ton of appendixes um, about reporting neglect and abuse. Um, I, as a staff person uh, here at Faith Church, am a mandated reporter. You, as a volunteer are not, but we need your help. And, and if there's anything or any time that a reg, there's a red flag for you when you're talking with someone, interacting with someone, uh, say, for example, they come in and they have a big bruise on their arm and you say, oh, what happened? Uh, and they say, oh, I, I can't tell you. Um, that's, that's a red flag. Um, please, please, please let a staff member know so that we can follow through on that. You are not... Uh, required to call DCS or DFS or whatever uh, on your own, but please let us know so that we can follow up appropriately. And I wish I could say that, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, just as an in case or it's never happened, but uh, it has. And uh, this is the world we live in, and it's sad, um, but we want to make sure that all of our folks are safe. 
Um, and so the last thing then is uh, after page 46, the page numbers kind of start all over again, and we have this whole section, courtesy of McLean Bible Church out in Virginia, uh, one of the forerunners of disability ministry in the country and, frankly, in the world, uh, put this resource together. And it's kind of an A to Z resource of different types of disabilities. And um, here's, my, uh, here's my encouragement to you. You could, you could read any one of these. Um, and you could kind of see like, okay, here are the common symptoms and features of Down syndrome. Here's the causes if you're interested in that. Um, here's some typical strengths and limitations. Um, it can be a helpful starting point, but I would end the same way we began this whole thing, and that is to come back to relationship. I, uh, I used to do trainings with a, a, a mom of two boys with autism, and she would always do an autism training and say, if you've met... One person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Meaning that everyone is a unique individual. And again, some of this stuff can be good baseline knowledge, but every person is, is unique uh, and is worth getting to know as an individual person. Uh, so that's all I have for you. Uh, thanks for bearing um, with this. And, and, uh, and again, most of all, for your investment in this ministry and in the lives of the participants and families that, uh, that are represented in it. Bless you. Uh, I pray for you, and I hope to see you real soon.